For our second hour of class tonight, we want to look at things that look, problems that look like this. Nine minus two times three plus seven. What, we have more than one operation that needs to be done there. Now, some people might look at that and think, we just go left to right. And that would make perfect sense, but it would give you the wrong answer. In math, we really like to have two people look at a problem and get the same answer for it. So to help with problems like this, we have defined something called the order of operations. Now, before we lay out the order of operations, there are two things I want to clarify. Number one, the order of operations only applies when it's just a list of numbers and operations like this. In real life and in practical application, most of the time, there's a situation that is, that is happening or a story problem basically going on. And that situation tells you what order the operation is going to be done in. So the order of operation only applies if there's no context or no situation that helps us figure out what to do first. Second, many of us have had the order of operations defined as a series of steps. And that's not really accurate. But the order of operations is, is actually levels of priority. So things of higher priority have to happen before things of lower priority. So the highest priority in our order of operations is something called enclosing symbols. Many of us have heard this one as just parentheses. And a set of parentheses is one type of enclosing symbol. But before we're done tonight, we're going to look at other types of enclosing symbols. The second level of priority most of us have had that defined as exponents. Exponents include two things. One, those powers that we just looked at. And two, their inverses, which are called roots. So exponents would happen first as long as there are no other enclosing symbols. The third level of priority is multiplication and division. I get asked all the time, well, which one happens first, multiplication or division? Remember, they really are the same operation, one going forward, one going in reverse. So they happen at the same time. I'll explain what I mean by at the same time in a little bit. The fourth and the lowest level of priority is addition and subtraction. So addition and subtraction can only be done if there's nothing else of higher priority to do. So let's go back to our original problem here and apply the orders of operations. Are there any enclosing symbols? No. Any exponents? No. Multiplication or division? Yes. We have 2 times 3, which makes 6. If I remove the 2 times 3 and I replace it with 6, the rest of the problem stays the same. So it's now 9 minus 6 plus 7. Any other multiplication or division? No. So we go to that lowest level, addition and subtraction. Well, there's one, adi one addition and one subtraction. How do we know what to do first? Well, within the levels of priority, if there are multiple things to do, then we will go left to right, just like reading a book. So here, addition and subtraction have the same priority. 
So we're just going to go left to right. What is 9 minus 6? 3. So we replace the 9 minus 6 with 3. The rest of the problem stays the same. What is 3 plus 7? 10. So our result is 10. Now I'm going to go back up here for a second. I often get the question, is this subtracting 2 times 3, or is this negative 2 times 3? And the answer is yes. It can be thought of as either way. Um, I can leave it just as it is, exactly the way we did it, and do 2 times 3 and then subtract it. Or... Or I could have said, hey, I don't want to subtract. I'm going to change it to plus the opposite. So instead of 9 minus 2 times 3 plus 7, it's 9 plus a negative 2 times 3 plus 7. Well, what that does to our result, let's take a look. Now we do have multiplication. It's negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. Now I should note that parentheses there is not considered an enclosing symbol because it's not separating one part of the problem from the rest. All it is doing is it is, is uh, specifying to us that it is a negative 6. It's enclosing that negative 6 so that it's clear that that's what it is. There's nothing else in there, so it really isn't, isn't separating part of the problem. So now there's no more multiplication or division. We'll add or subtract. 9 plus negative 6 is 3. 3 plus 7 is still 10. So it doesn't change the result of our, our problem. It just changes our approach. To me, it's usually easier to just do the 2 times 3 and leave it as Let's try something just a little bit more strenuous. Days. Yeah, we don't need to do that. Just a little bit more strenuous. This one looks like kind of a monster, um, but as long as we go step by step, it's no more difficult than what we did before. Our first level of priority is enclosing symbols. Now we see multiple parentheses here. We work left to right. This is our first one right here, left to right. Now we need to find its name, its other end. Is this one it? No, it's facing the wrong way. How about this one? Nope, that goes back to the last one here. We have to go all the way down here to find the other end of our set of parentheses. So we're going to start our problem working inside that set of parentheses. Inside the blue box, if you will. Inside there, the order of operations still applies. Are there other enclosing symbols inside there? Yes, there's another parentheses. So now we have to narrow our focus down inside that set of parentheses. Inside the green box. In there, we still apply our order of operations. Are there any more enclosing symbols? No. Any exponents? No. We do, however, have multiplication. 2 times 6. What is 2 times 6? 12. 
So I take out the 2 times 6, and I'm going to replace it with 12. The rest of the problem stays totally unchanged. In each step of an order of operations problem, you are taking two numbers and combining them to make one, and nothing else changes. Where I see the most mistakes made is people don't want to rewrite it all over and over. They try to combine two or three steps all at once, and they make mistakes there. So now we're still inside this set of parentheses here. All that is left to do is 15 minus 12, which is 3. Now what I, I've reduced what's in that parentheses to a single number. There's nothing left to separate from the rest of the problem anymore. So if I'm, when I'm down to a single number, I can get rid of the parentheses. I don't need them anymore. I have completed the green box set of parentheses. So now we're back out to this larger set of parentheses, back out to the blue box. So now we have to go through our levels of priority again. Are there any other enclosing symbols? No. Exponents. Yes, there are. 2 squared, or 2 to the power of 2. What is that? 2 to the power of 2 is 4. So I take out the 2 squared. I replace it with 4. Everything else stays the same. Now, rewriting the rest of the problem is another spot where I see a lot of mistakes happening. And part of the reason that that happens is people get a little careless and they, they miss something. But also because many times as you're rewriting the rest of the problem, you'll see something, oh, I, I'm going to combine that too quick. And in many cases, it's not something that you can combine quite yet. So like I said, take the time and just meticulously go one piece at a time, one step at a time. Now we're still inside that parentheses. No more exponents, so we're down to multiplication and division. And we have both. We're going to go left to right. So going left to right, what's our first multiplication or division? 4 times 9, good. Which is? 36. So replace the 4 times 9 with 36. Everything else keeps stays the same. What's next inside the parentheses? Thirty-six divided by four. It's multiplication or division. So thirty-six divided by four, which is nine. So replace that with 9, the rest of it stays the same. What's next? We still have the 3 times 2 to do in the parentheses, which is 6. Still working in those parentheses, but we have no more multiplication or division to do. So we're down to our lowest level of priority. All that is left is addition and subtraction. What do we do first? Okay. 
left to right. So the first one would be 13 minus 3, which is 10. Next, 10 plus 9 is 19. Yeah, these long ones take a lot of paper, don't they? Next, 19 minus 6 is 13. Now I've reduced that set of parentheses to a single number again, which means I can get rid of the parentheses. Now, this time, however, there's something I have to be careful of. Can anybody see what it is? Yeah, there's no operation between the two and the parentheses there. What does that imply? It implies multiplication. So when I take out the parentheses, I have to put in that multiplication symbol. Now there are no more enclosing symbols. There actually are no more exponents. Multiplication and division, we're gonna go left to right. Two times 13 is 26. Next, there's another multiplication yet. Five times seven is 35. Now we're down again to addition and subtraction. We actually only have addition. Left to right, 7 plus 26 is 33. And finally, 33 plus 35 is 68. A lot of steps, but again, you just follow the rules. Follow the levels of priority. Hey, Casey. If we look at other examples. Like this one here. To make sense of this one, we first have to figure out what this line is about. What does that line mean? Okay, divide. Most people will say divide. Um, it's called a fraction bar, and it does mean divide, but it is also an enclosing symbol. It's separating part of the problem from the rest. So it's telling us we have to do everything on top first. Then we have to do everything on bottom. Then we can divide. So let's do everything on top first. I'm going to move it over here so I have room to, to do it. 9 squared minus 18 divided by 2. What do I have to do first there? 9 squared, which is... 81. Everything else will stay the same. What happens next? We'll do the division. 18 divided by 2 is 9. Now, of course, all that's left there on top is 81 minus 9, which is 72. So the top is 72. Come on. I'm bottom. What do we have to do first? A lot of people missed this. The exponent. Yes, the 6 squared. 6 squared is 36. We had to do the exponent first. 
Now we have just multiplication and division next. We'll go left to right. 5 times 7 35. Next step. 36 divided by 36 is 1. There we go. And finally, we have just 35 plus 1, which is 36. So the bottom is 36. So we've completed everything on top. We've completed everything on bottom. Now we can divide. What is 72 divided by 36? It's just two. Okay. So that was another type of enclosing symbol that we can encounter. We can also encounter ones that look like this. Looking at this one, first of all, what is this symbol here? It's a square root. It's actually a type of exponent. But in this problem, it is also an enclosing symbol because it separates part of the problem from the rest. So we have to do what is inside that enclosing symbol first. So inside there, what has to happen first? The exponent, 3 squared, which is 9, right? Are we kidding me? There we go, 9. What's next inside there? Do the multiplication. 7 times 9, which is 63. What's next? Oops, I put this should be plus, right? All that's left in there is 1 plus 63, which is 64. Now, just like the parentheses as an enclosing symbol, I've reduced what's inside that square root to a single number. So I can get rid of the square root. But there are two, th two, two differences here. One, I have to wait to see if it is, since that square root is a, an exponent, it is in our levels of priority, I have to wait to see if there are any other enclosing symbols that have to get done first. In this case, there are not. Second, when I remove the square root, rather than just removing it like parentheses, there's something I actually have to do. I actually have to perform the square root. What is the square root of 64? 8. So I remove the square root symbol, I perform the square root, and it's 8. Now, just like with the parentheses, there's a 2 here in front of that square root with no operation. It is implied to be Multiplication. So now we're done with the enclosing symbols and the, the exponents all at once. All we have left is multiplication and then subtraction. So we're going to do our multiplication left to right. 8 times 4, 32. Then we do 2 times 8, 16. We subtract 32 minus 16 is 16. So our answer is 16.
since we saw the square root there, I want to talk a little bit about that square root. Five squared again was what? 25. Okay. We've talked about those inverses, those pairs of operations, how addition and subtraction work together because you add something, well, you can subtract it to get back to where you started. Multiplication and division are inverses. They work together. You multiply by something, you can divide it to get back where you started. With our powers, we have roots. The square root of 25 is asking what number squared equals 25? Well, what would that number be? Well, we just saw up here that 5 squared is 25. So the square root of 25 would be 5. But we also saw that negative 5 squared is 25, right? So if we go back here to this definition, what squared is 25? Well, negative 5 squared is also 25. So the square root of 25, according to that, would be negative 5. So the answer is both, 5 and negative 5, which always brings us to this one. What is the square root of negative 9? A lot of people want to say negative 3. But if I punch this into my calculator, you just need, and most of the you just need a second key to your square root. You hit second, and it's above your x squared key, use your square root. Type in negative 9. Hit enter, and your calculator says bad, says bad things to you. It says error. Remember, this is asking what number squared equals a negative 9? If I square negative 3, what do I get? Yeah, negative 3 times negative 3 is a positive 9. A negative times a negative will always be positive, right? Well, if I square a positive number, like a 4... A positive times a positive will always be positive. So as we saw earlier, anytime we square a number, the result has to be positive. Because of that, we cannot take the square root of a negative number because there is nothing squared that can give us a negative result. Now, this next part, you can pretend you don't hear if you want to. At this point, that's what we're going to say. We are going to say that you cannot square the negative. If you were to continue on into a bachelor's degree, uh, many of you would have to take a college algebra class, or at the very least, an intermediate algebra class. And in that intermediate algebra class, they would show you something like this where they take the square root of a negative 1 and they define it to be the letter I. It's called an imaginary number. What it is, is since in the real world, we can't take the square root of a negative, they made up an answer for it. They made up a world where you can square it negative. And they imagined that world and now use it. Um, in practical applications, there are cases where those imaginary numbers are useful. Um, they're useful in electronics and circuit analysis. Um, you get into complex circuits like capacitor, inductor, and resistance circuits, impedance circuits. Um, there is imaginary resistances and imaginary impedances and stuff that go on 
and your phasers and all that. And I know I'm speaking engineer gibberish here for, for you, and I'm sorry. Um, but there are practical applications for it. For us, at this point, we are going to pretend that that does not exist because that's beyond the scope of this course. But I didn't want to tell you that you can't take the square root of a negative and then later in life take a class like that and realize you can take the square root of a negative. So that's just my way of full disclosure there. Okay. The last thing we want to talk about tonight. Is something called absolute value. And absolute value actually goes back to these vectors that we started talking about for our combining integers. An absolute value is nothing more than the magnitude of the vector. So let's say we have the vector negative 6 again. That's the vector for negative 6. How long is that vector? 6 units. Its magnitude is six units long. The symbol for absolute value is this, two vertical lines. So the absolute value of negative six is what that's saying there. It would be six because the vector for negative six is six units long. An alternative definition of absolute value, by the way, is just equal. And it's really not an alternative, it's the same definition. The magnitude of the vector is the distance from zero for that, that item. So we might have something like this, the absolute value of 8 minus 13. An absolute value is an enclosing symbol. We must do what is inside of it first. What is 8 minus 13? Negative 5. Good. Once you have reduced what is inside that absolute value, just like any other enclosing symbol, once you've reduced it to a single number, we can get rid of the enclosing symbol. Just like with the square root, though, when we get rid of that symbol, we have to do something. Here we have to Form the absolute value. What is the absolute value of negative five? Five. Yes, the length of its the magnitude of its vector is five. Do not get caught in the trap that is very common of thinking absolute values make everything fine. It's not necessarily true. We can work with absolute values and still end up with negative results. We can have something like this. Again, the absolute value is an enclosing symbol, so we're going to do what's in there first. Order of operations still applies in there. We have to multiply before we can subtract. So 3 times 6 is 18. Now all that's left inside the absolute value is 7 minus 18, which is negative 11. Now that that absolute value, what's inside it, has been reduced to a single number, I can get rid of the absolute value symbols. And when I do that, I have to take the absolute value of negative 11, which is 11. There was the negative 5 out here with no operation, so that implies multiplication. So what we have now is negative 5 times 11, which is 
negative 55. I am looking around the room and I am getting that no vacancy signal from everybody. It means we've had enough for one night. So I will give you the last 15, 16 minutes here to get started on your homework if you want to. Like I said, here in the right state, the next room is open and it's computer lab over there. You're free to work if you want to. Near Richmond, the network will stay up till at least 520. So if you want to get started on your homework somewhere in the building, you're, you're free to come back and ask questions. But homework one will be due Tuesday. Um, please feel free to use the Ask My Instructor questions in there to ask me questions on it. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.